The Patrick Riggins Show. Call in now, 865-243-TALK. That's 243-8255. And now your host, Patrick Riggins. You are listening to The Patrick Riggins Show. Where, if it takes forever, I will die trying to make everyone understand the true American way. The true American spirit that made this country great. Assisting me in this noble endeavor is the dominating radio station of this area, WNOX FM 100.3. We are pouring out 100,000 watts of RF power enabling us to be heard in parts of five southeastern states and two time zones. We are also broadcasting worldwide via the Internet. All you need to do is tune in there is to bring up your web browser and type in www.wnoxfm.com. There you can watch and listen to this show being broadcast courtesy of our in-studio webcam. If you have a slow computer or just now getting your web browser up because of that slow computer, that address again is WNOXFM.com. If you're watching on the Internet, you'll see me sitting here at the microphone and another person to my left who appears to be trying to stay awake. (laughs) (laughs) That person is Tori, our show producer, who you hear all through the shows on Sunday. And you actually, I was listening to you earlier, and and you sounded like you were actually with us, like... Like that gig last night didn't take it all out of you, or is that just caffeine? Uh, yeah, I woke up since then. It's, yeah, wheeling and dealing this morning. I wasn't as sharp, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a late night last night. Yeah, though. and uh, Corey or Tori, uh, for those of you who haven't been listening, played. Uh, he has he's in a band called Cork Jar, and they played at the Well last night. So I guess it's a good gig. Yeah, and great. Yeah, thanks to those who came out and the other bands. Uh, Gorilla Sons and Phoenix Bloom, both really, really good bands. I mean, everybody just really kicked it last night. It was fun had by all. Yes, unlike Except Saturday, uh, earlier that day, Saturday. Yes, it was a bit of a morning. <laughs> and, and, and Patrick did not show up for his autograph Patrick, session no, again. Patrick, again, I was flaking out. Flaking you know, that, out. That's what happens when you, you achieve this celebrity status. You know, you start... Oh, I don't have to show up for that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to start uh, getting yeah. your fans pulling angry the, at you. If pulling you, the Lindsay Lohan. Up. Yeah, because, I mean, these fans, they come out, they, they plan it all week. Yeah. They, they can't wait to get there to meet you and yeah. have you sign their and you sure stuff they weren't and mistaken. kiss their babies. I, mean, and I, I think they, they would show up because they thought, you know, when David Posey was out here, they thought it was him. And now I think they, you know, they they get me confused with Spanky Brown. No, no, it's it's you. They were they were chanting your name, Patrick, Patrick. They wouldn't let no bands go on stage until you can. It was awful. It's ugly. Were they holding though pitchforks and and uh, (laughs) torches though? That's that that's a different kind of chant. No, that was the UT crowd um, after the (laughs) fuck. They were marching down Cumberland Uh, with pitchforks. That was Dooley's fan base at the moment. But well, no, thank you for everybody that came out. Yeah, that's again, and we'll keep you apprised. Is anything on the horizon? No, Nothing on not the books, yet. either band, so a little so, bit of a break. little downtime. Yeah. Well, you need that every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, I've been pretty busy lately as far as that goes. So, uh, All right, well, again, thank you for tuning into the show this week. Each week, i like to thank you, the listening audience, for making this show so successful Our numbers grow every week, and that is a testament to the effectiveness of this radio show and the impact it is having on the listeners. This week, we have had a lot going on, and I'll try to get to as much of it as I can. I talk about events from a perspective that, well, you're not going to get it anywhere else. I don't know really know why that is. I come at things from the side of truth and the Constitution, and you would think that would be the default thinking But listening to the news day in and day out, it it really isn't. As this show gets more popular, and I get recognized on the street more and more, frequently the conversation evolves from, hey, I love the show, to questions about the content. And one question that pops up sometimes is, why I try to cover so many topics during my one-hour show? Why don't I just limit it to one topic? Many show hosts will take a show subject and make it last 
well, heck, two hours of a three-hour show. I really don't see a need for that. I think that is a waste of your valuable time. I am here to educate and inform, not educate like in college where they chew up your time and money requiring you to take needless classes, but educate with an eye towards efficiency. I want you to get good information so you can make good decisions. And doing that does not require hours and hours of mindless blather to cover something that is mostly cut and dried. For instance, I'm not going to sit here and talk and talk about why we shouldn't take money from one citizen and give it to another. That There should not be any debate on that subject. We just don't have time to meet, beat these dead horses. This is a problem we are having in this country today. Everyone wants to sit around and, and they want to talk about problems instead of doing something about it. This is one of the key obstacles that results when you have a bunch of academics in politics. You see, they are used to sitting around having debates and high-minded discussions and not making things happen. I believe this audience is different. It's a group of doers, not just talkers. They want to get together and make the necessary changes needed in this country. They are wanting to save America before it is too late. All of these debates and discussions really can be solved with just one question. Is it constitutional or not? If not, then we shouldn't be doing it. This is what these presidential election boils down to. Which candidate is going to respect the Constitution? If you listen to what they're saying, then it's neither the Democrat nominee nor the Republican nominee for sure. But to listen to the commentators on either side, it's going to be Armageddon if one or the other is elected or re-elected. But what if we elect one or the other and nothing changes? Andrew Napolitano wrote a column, and his column involved a series of questions. One of them was, what if the principal party's candidates for president really agree more than they disagree? What if they both support the authority of the federal government to spy on Americans without search warrants? And he continues on and, and goes through a column on this, and we'll put this on our Facebook page. He wants you to think about these questions and realize there isn't a whole lot of difference between the two of them. And what we need to do is basically get Congress and pressure them to make these changes because they're the ones who ultimately are in charge anyway. I've covered a lot of these ideas on this show over the past spring and summer, and I'll continue to discuss them even after this election. But I think it's important you think about these types of questions. Even though both sides, as I said, preach doom and gloom, should the other win election, just remember it is Congress that can stop all this. Congress has the final say. So we are up on the first break in the show. We'll have a lot more. We'll get started right after these messages. This is Patrick Riggins on The Patrick Riggins Show. We'll be back after these messages. Fighting for freedom, liberty, and the restoration of the Constitution. The Patrick Riggins Show. Call in now at 865-243-8255. That's 243-TALK. And now your host, Patrick Riggins. This is Patrick Riggins with The Patrick Riggins Show. Having interesting off mic conversations within the studio. <laughs> off mic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yes. Shut up, Brad. Yeah. One. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really good that, of course, if you're on WNX, WNOXFM dot com, you can watch it online. But it's good that you can't hear it. What's going on in between? Of course, you hear yes. the broadcast, what everyone hears going out on the radio. Yes. But the mics are turned off between that. And that's so. why they do turn off. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> one day, one day, I'll write a book, and everyone in the audience will know what gets talked about here. So, <laughs> And Tori will go into hiding. <laughs> yeah, can, you, can you wait till my retirement for that to happen? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. This week... The, the tragic story of what happened in Libya has been, well, and all over the Middle East, has been all over the news this week. And I've had quite a few emails <coughs> coming in asking, well, what I think of it. By the way, if you want to email the show, the email address is patrickriggenshow at gmail.com. I think the reason I get asked about this sort of thing is because of my unique views towards current events. Views that you'll really hear nowhere else because I'm not there. I'm here. 
So by tuning in, you will sometimes hear things which you may agree with, and sometimes you will hear things you don't agree with. Contrary to what we are told in society nowadays, that is a good thing. A contrary or maybe not exactly parallel view of what you think is always good to consider. It keeps you thinking. It keeps you evaluating your positions so that you can have the confidence to stand for what you believe in. The result is your principles are well thought out and not just adopted from whatever your friends are saying or what you saw on the news last night or some commentators or even mine, although you would do well to consider, seriously consider mine and disregard those others. But <laughs> anyway, back to Libya. I think it is interesting to watch the politicians all position themselves as outraged about the killing of our ambassador, which, by the way, is a perfectly articulable, if there's a word such as that, act of war. After watching this night after night this week, it, it hurts our pride and our ego to see what happened. But what is the answer to it? Go over and get some payback? Then what? The lesson here is to learn from what happened. That is how we avenge these people's lives. By not making the same mistakes again and getting more people killed. Otherwise, these people died in vain. If we weren't over there to begin with, then all they could do is burn our flag and scream and yell about us. But who cares? The wannabe leaders in that country do. That's who. You see, by keeping us involved over there, these people have someone for the population to hate. By doing that, it keeps them all focused on how much they hate us, and they don't consider our other traits, such as freedom and liberty. Two things that I'm sure a large majority of the citizenry over there might like to try if given the opportunity. Fear and hatred are really good tools for oppression, though. These religious leaders use them to incite violence towards people or ideas that threaten their power, just like our government uses fear of terrorists, drug users, etc., to accomplish the goals it has. It all boils down to power and exercising it over other people. If the leaders really believed and wanted to follow their religion, then why is it important to drag others along? This is why religions that rely on oppression are not really interested in helping the follower, just empowering the leaders. Hillary Clinton gave a speech when, when they flew the bodies back home, and, and she said this, the ambassador and these other Americans gave their lives for others. They didn't give their lives for anyone nor anything. Who would give their life for Libya, a country that is in turmoil? Their lives were taken from them with somewhat of the complicity of the United States government. Much like all these people who have lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan, they didn't give their lives for those people. Those lives were taken from them to support a flawed foreign policy. I am not denigrating what these people who have lost their lives over there have done, though. I'm saying it is a waste and a disgrace for our country to be sending Americans to possibly lose their lives for people who don't want them there or don't care. As I mentioned on this show a few weeks ago, we have been meddling in the affairs of the Middle East for far too long. It is interesting to note that Oftentimes, the reason to not elect Obama is given as it would be history repeating itself. Many conservative commentators have been drawing the line between Obama and Jimmy Carter for a while now. But these same people will turn around and say we need to go into Afghanistan or Syria or Iran. When, if you look at history, these people have been fighting in this region for a long, long time. And yet... We think all of a sudden we have the answer for them. Are we not learning from history? Oh, I, I guess we only make that argument if it's in line with what we want to do. So we shouldn't ignore history when it comes to this country. But we should ignore it in all these other countries who have been warring among themselves for what seems like forever. Our government has a really interesting way 
of not practicing what it preaches on both domestic and foreign relations. We tell other nations not to attack and kill people, yet we do it with an annoying regularity. Our president practically bragged about how he has a kill list of people in the world, people who are subject to extermination without so much of as, as, as a trial. We don't even notify them of the, quote, death sentence that has been imposed on them entirely without their knowledge and also without given, being given an opportunity to answer the charges. What happened to innocent until proven guilty? Is that not something owed to every human? Or is it just Americans who are special enough for that treatment? Our founders realized humans are born with natural rights, and these must be respected. I would think a right to live is at the very top of that list. But here is our CIA flying pilotless drones all around the world, and not just spying, but killing people with them. I guess if there's not any pilot, it almost becomes like a video game. You know, just watch the monitor, press a button, and presto, another human is removed from planet Earth. Let's face it, our country has become a merchant and promoter of war and killing in the world. 78% of the global arms trade is provided by the United States. We are the top dog in that category. So who comes in second at 5.6%? 5.6% versus our 78. It's Russia. Everyone else is far behind. It is almost in our best interest to have wars going because it provides so much money to our economy. We also have an estimated... 1,000 to 1,200 military bases all around the world. Is there any reason for this? Is there any need? Well, Patrick, you might say, we have to be the world's policemen. We are the good guys. Well, are we? Do good guys kill others without a trial? Do good guys needlessly slaughter citizens of other countries and call it collateral damage? Oh, well... You know, they had it coming. I guess that's what they get for living too close to a terrorist. Or what the United States government deems a terrorist anyway. A story out of Yemen a few weeks ago accused the United States of killing 13 civilians in an aerial attack. It was a drone, but still an aerial attack nonetheless. Members of the Yemeni government told reporters that an unmanned aerial vehicle operated remotely by the United States military killed more than a dozen civilians, including three women, near a town there in uh, uh, it's the town of Rada in Al, uh, looks like Albaitha province. But anyway, a senior Yemeni defense official said, quote, This was one of the very few times when our target was completely missed. It was a mistake, but we hope it will not hurt our anti-terror efforts in the region, unquote. Does not anyone else find this crazy it is no wonder why the people in the middle east hate the united states i would hate a country that is violating our sovereign airspace and killing our citizens yet we continue with this insanity telling ourselves we are defeating the enemy but our so-called defeating of the enemy is only fueling its growth so when does it all end when we've killed everyone in the middle east when everyone over there signs a declaration of allegiance to the United States? When the head of an organization sits down and signs a peace agreement? But wait, there isn't a head. And there isn't just one organization. So how can this war ever be over? The truth of the matter is, no one making money or acquiring power is interested in having this war be over. They are making too much money and governments around the world are getting too much power from it. After all, if you are a leader of a third world country and you have some political opponents you need eliminated, what better way than to ring up the United States and tell them you're having a terrorist problem? Hello, CIA? Hey, yeah, I need you to come over and eliminate some al-Qaeda from my country. And, of course, the CIA is more than happy to come over and accommodate you. That is just one more base they can use in that part of the world. Heck, we'll probably even give that country some foreign aid for the leaders to put away in Swiss bank accounts. After we hire all of, all of their friends and relatives to help out with the operation, of course, the, the leader will be set for life. 
surprisingly, the American public is either largely unaware or they don't care about these shenanigans. That's partly what we're doing on this radio show, trying to raise the level of awareness. I want you to think about these things and look at what our government is doing overseas and how it's wrong and how we need to stop it. Again, the way to stop that, putting pressure on Congress. We've come up on the half-hour break here on the Patrick Regan Show. We'll be back with some more. And, uh, well, I don't know what it, Yeah, we'll talk about maybe the Afghan attack and some other things. We'll be back after these messages. Fighting for freedom, liberty, and the restoration of the Constitution. The Patrick Regan Show. Call in now at 865-243-8255. That's 243-TALK. And now your host... Patrick Riggins. Welcome back to the Patrick Riggins Show. Tori getting a little caught up in the music there, missing the cues. I like Neil Sedaka. Yeah. <laughs> I like that song. That is a guy singing. Yes. Like I said, I always thought it was Carol Kane or something like that. Or something like that, yeah. I tell you what, what this song, uh, this song, I tell you, one time I go see a movie, right? And uh, have a date along, of course. Go into the movie theater. It's dry. It's not, you know, anything going on. It's night, though. It's like 9.30 or so when the movie starts. So the movie gets over at like 11 or whatever. But it's late. Go out. It is pouring down rain. I mean, it's like someone's just pouring a bucket out. And it's late, so you can't go in a store and get a, a uh, umbrella. So we have to run in and out of the stores you know the little overhangs all the way down the street to get to where the car is parked of course the car is parked other side of the street across a broad open span lots of puddles so we end up just getting soaked anyway trying to get to the car so <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything well you had laughter in the song. rain uh, exactly well it was a. Uh, it was funny at the time. It was. <laughs> Ooh, I hear cussing in the rain. Yeah. That would be me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you have that, uh, you know, you're out with somebody and you're like, oh, everything's fine. You know, it could be storming and raining and everything's, it's just. Uh, it's still it, trying to make a good impression. Yeah. And it's still fronting. Still fronting. Have the BS going. Yeah. And then, uh, then once you get married. Then stuff like that is just pain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's when the BS stops. <laughs> <laughs> and they find the real you. <laughs> that's that's what scares so many women off for me. They're going, wow, that, that boy is dark. <laughs> and that's why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, get out now. <laughs> All right. Um Okay, kind of going along the same line here as that last segment. We've got a, I've got a story here that, uh, well, let's see where it was from. Fox News, that's where it's from. But it's entitled, Afghan Attack Kills Four U.S. Troops. It uh, was today, actually, and today the 16th, yeah. So uh, it says, though, uh, four American service members were killed Sunday after a man in an Afghan police officer uniform turned his gun and started firing at a remote checkpoint in southern Afghanistan. Afghan officials said the checkpoint in Zabul province's Mizan district came under attack first from insurgents sometime around midnight. American forces came to help the Afghan police respond to the attack. It was not clear if some of the Afghan police turned on their American helpers in the middle of the battle with the insurgents or afterward or were somehow forced into attacking the American troops by the insurgents. So, okay, somehow the Afghan police uh, might have been forced into attacking the Americans. Yeah, I can see that. Right in the middle of a battle, the insurgents had enough time to get all these people together and make them fight the Americans. Right. This foreign policy is almost becoming, let's see what story they will believe today from the administration well from our supposed allies and from the media does anyone else get the feeling that maybe we're being lied to on a regular basis oh no anyway uh, back to the story here taliban spokesman yusef akmadi said the police who attacked were not affiliated with the taliban insurgency 
But they are Afghans, and they know that Americans are our enemy, he said. The police who have fled have joined up with the insurgency. So, it sounds to me like they were planning on this all along. These police obviously decided before joining up the insurgency, they'd build some street cred by killing Americans. Anyway, in the story, so far this year, 51 international service members have died at the hands of Afghan soldiers or policemen or insurgents wearing their uniforms. At least 12 such attacks came in August alone, leaving 15 dead. The checkpoint attack was the third attack by Afghan forces or insurgents disguised in military uniforms against international forces in as many days, killing eight troops in all. So why is this happening? Why are our friends shooting at us? Let's read another story from yesterday. It's entitled, Afghan officials say eight women killed in an airstrike. Afghan officials say a NATO airstrike killed eight women and girls who were out gathering firewood before dawn in a remote region on the east of the, in the east of the country. The coalition says it believes only insurgents were hit. Isn't that the same story we're told over and over? Only insurgents were hit. Of course. The way we count the, the way we count who is an insurgent and who isn't then I guess only insurgents were hit because we count just about everybody as an insurgent. The story also goes on. Seven injured females were brought to area hospitals for treatment, some of them as young as 10 years old, said a provincial health director. I guess those were insurgents as well. It says uh, also they may have been five to eight Afghan civilians killed in the strike, said Captain Dan Einhart, a spokesman for international forces in Afghanistan. He said they were still investigating the report. Protecting Afghan lives is the cornerstone of our mission and it saddens us to it saddens us as we learn that our action might have unintentionally harmed civilians, said Jamie Graybeal, another spokesman for the international military in Afghanistan. So now we're admitting we might have killed some civilians as well. And to do a little CYA, the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, said he strongly condemns the airstrike by NATO forces, which resulted in the deaths of eight women. A statement from his office said, he said the Afghan government was also investigating. With this going on, we sit over here in this country and wonder why these people don't like us. To counter these types of stories, we are told the insurgents will fire on their own people in order to boost the number of civilians killed in order to anger the population. So (laughs) we can't win. If we somehow miss the civilians and only kill the bad guys, then the bad guy's friends will make sure some civilians get killed and blame us for it. The Afghan war is not winnable, not in the sense we are used to. These people have been fighting for generations. Why are they all of a sudden going to stop and play nicely? Because we told them to? Because we're going to make them? They have to want to do it. And they have demonstrated they don't. These people are not ever going to clean up their country until they decide to do it. So what's the alternative for us? I think it's pretty simple. Either we commit to wiping out a large part of that country's population, or we get out. We have been involving ourselves in wars that never lead anywhere. We don't have an exit strategy. We don't have a clear leader we can eliminate or that we can com- who, who can commit their country to surrender. So what do we do? Well, we sit around pondering it, and all this time our soldiers are being killed, our nation is being bankrupt, and our rights and freedoms are being taken away. So who's winning in this scenario? Because someone must be for us to be continuing with it, Bureaucratic momentum can't explain it all. The truth is the governments are winning. Our government is getting to spend loads of money on fighting and weapons, which raises our representatives' campaign donations from the companies profiting from these escapades. The other country's government wins because it gets loads of money and assistance from our government, which means it gets our money, the taxpayers, because the only money our government has is ours. All of the leader's friends over there and associates get loads of money as well because they are the ones doing business with us over there. 
So they all get their cuts. So who gets screwed? What's well, us and them, the citizens of their country and our country? We get screwed because we're spending money we don't have and giving up freedoms for a war that is not benefiting us at all. The citizens of that country get screwed because their government has an interest in keeping the problems going. Because otherwise, if the job gets finished, we leave. And we take a lot of money with us. Although I'm sure we'll continue to pour foreign aid into the country, which their leaders are all too eager to accept. So, oh, we're up on the last segment of the show here, the last break. This show just flies by. I tell you, we've got so much information, and, and I hope you guys are, are making note of it and thinking about what you're going to talk to your congressman about. This is Patrick Riggins with The Patrick Riggins Show. We'll be back after these messages. Fighting for freedom, liberty, and the restoration of the Constitution. The Patrick Riggins Show. Call in now at 865-243-8255. That's 243-TALK. And now your host, Patrick Riggins. Welcome back to the Patrick Riggins Show. I've got it together, Tori. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Everybody watching online? Oh. Uh, it wondering. is truly behind the scenes. If you if you <laughs> yeah. check out the the studio cam, it is a lot of stuff going on. I tell you, I was uh, kind of plug Spanky show there right before ours there, and uh, he was talking about losing weight. If you want good exercise, run to the bathroom during a short commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> that that is some uh, that's some exercise. <laughs> actually, 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 I broke my foot doing that at a station i used to work at years ago really to the running to the bathroom during a break and i was running back through the hallway just getting it running as fast as i can and somebody came out of another studio and said something and i stopped planted on my left foot and you heard it snap and i fractured it across the center of my foot oh nice from a bathroom break and you don't have a good story <laughs> you know that that's not like you're in a bar fight or something it's no. six guys and one of them stepped on your foot but you put the others in the hospital radio related radio yeah i was running down the hall from the bathroom yeah you can't <laughs> broadcasting that's just relating not, yeah that's just not a good enough story no. <laughs> but that's all i got so. that's all, yeah you make it up then <laughs> our government makes up stuff why shouldn't the citizens <laughs> Can you dig it? Yeah. <laughs> Can you dig it? <laughs> Can you dig it? <laughs> <laughs> Tori getting his buttons pushed over or pushing the buttons. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> yeah. Everyone out there is going, okay, we got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, never know what's going to happen on the Patrick Reagan show. <laughs> all right last segment of the show here and we've been kind of talking about the middle east and i've got a good argue our argument a good ar- article by matt welch this weekend and what he stated and i think it's an important thing to remember after everything that's happened here you don't blame a YouTube video for inciting the mob that killed the U.S. ambassador. You blame the killers. In his column, he wrote, It's a modern marvel to witness how thoroughly the country's journalists and commentators have, over the past decade, internalized false notions about Muslims, violence, and free expression. For instance, the depicting of the historical figure of Muhammad is untenable blasphemy that the mere discussion about the proposed portrayal of a cartoon Muhammad bear suit should be avoided at all costs in order to avoid a potential spasm of Mideast violence and that retreating so abjectly from the defense of free speech will somehow make the world a safer place basically what he's stating there is just by not talking about it the Middle East isn't all of a sudden going to turn around and, and send us roses. It's just not going to happen. He went on to state, Western countries without a First Amendment prosecute blasphemers. Even free speech heroes like Penn Jillette of Penn and Teller will acknowledge that his act won't tackle Islam because they have families. So it shouldn't come as a great surprise that now, after a Tuesday night savage murder of four Americans in Libya, including Ambassador J. Christopher Stevens, a sector of the American commentariat 
is calling for the heads of the lunatic Florida pastor Terry Jones and a bizarro world filmmaker who goes by the name Sam Basile. Some of them seem to go as far as to agree with Mohammed al-Zawahiri that the filmmaker should be arrested and brought to trial. Mr. Welch went on to say, uh, University of Pennsylvania Associate Professor of Religious Studies Anthea Butler, for example, tweeted, How soon is Sam Basile going to be, or how soon is it until he's in jail, folks? I need him to go now. When Americans die because you're stupid, then these things are what should happen. Also in the Huffington Post, Reverend Stephen Martin, hey, <laughs> Reverend Steve Martin. <laughs> he, uh, Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> he said, uh, I have no sympathy for anyone who would assassinate a U.S. ambassador, Martin wrote, but I have even less sympathy for filmmakers who spread hatred and for pastors who knowingly incite violence. Mr. Welch went on to say... Um, uh, oh, you had something? No, I, I was just going to say, although it's freedom of speech. It is freedom of speech, but, and, and that's what this column is really about, is is the fact that we're restricting freedom of speech now based on the fact that we're going to upset people over in the Middle East, and they're going to start rioting. It's, it's freedom of speech and, until you offend me. Then you don't have the freedom of speech anymore. Yeah, and well, that's that's what they feel yeah. like over there, and, and the threat is if you talk about something we don't like we're just going to kill you and while we sit in this country and laugh about that sort of thing happening in another country it is happening in this country because as we see right here in this column what's happening over there the suppression of free speech and suppression of many basic human rights is causing us to have our rights suppressed just look at this whole terrorism thing. I addressed this last week. How have the terrorists succeeded in causing us problems? And this is part of it. We've lost many freedoms and liberties in this country as a direct cause of the war on terror. We sit here and say we're being safer and, and everything, but we're really not. We're just operating under what they call well, a lot of people call it online the theater of safety because it is just a show. And we're really, what we need to do, I guess, we, uh, is what I'm trying to get to is, is just be ourselves, be Americans, be the shining light of the world that people aspire to. And don't worry about what all these other people have to say. Uh, but again, getting back to this, um, Ferris Stockman, the Boston Globe said, shouldn't people who knowingly incite violence against the United States as a crude thinly veiled publicity stunt also be held accountable i can't think of a time when the reckless actions of a few private citizens have cost us so much in american lives taxpayers and credibility around the world what mr welch is talking about here is as, as we've said we we're not only encouraging the easily offended to lower their outrage bar and thus we're perpetuating this this cycle of stifled speech in in our country and in the west and you're just reinforcing this. And when we're rewarding this behavior, we're getting more of it. It just doesn't matter. We, we continue to make excuses for this bad behavior. We do it in this country all the time. And then we're surprised when we get more of it. These are the problems we need to start addressing in this country, or, or we can just expect more of them. All right, we're up on the end of the show here. Again, a fantastic show with uh, Patrick Riggins' show. I appreciate everyone tuning in and listening. If you'd like more information, you can go to our Facebook page at facebook.com, and it's forward slash Patrick Riggins Show. Also, be sure and hit that like button on there, and you can be that'll keep you updated on everything we post during the week. I like it. You like it. And also, if you don't have to have a Facebook account, you can just go to that facebook.com forward slash Patrick Riggins Show, and you can see it, even if you don't have a Facebook account. You just, just have a face. Just have a face. You don't have to have the book. <laughs> uh, we're also on Twitter uh, if you on there the little at sign Patrick Riggins and if you miss anything or want to go back and hear something and, and say yeah Patrick really may be mad when he said that <laughs> you can go to uh, <laughs> youtube.com forward slash Patrick Riggins show that's R-I-G-G-I-N-S that's how you spell Riggins not Patrick 
<laughs> and, uh, Captain and, Obvious strikes yes. again. <laughs> yeah. And also, all the old shows, or most of the old shows are on there as well. This show will be on there probably in a day or so. Anyway, join me next Sunday afternoon, when once again we'll talk about freedom, liberty, and the restoration of that good old document we ignore, the, rest or the Constitution. <laughs> this is Patrick Riggins. We'll see you next Sunday afternoon at 4. Have a great week. Join us again next week for a solid dose of truth on The Patrick Riggins Show. Every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. Be there.